welcome to Current Affairs. My name is Nathan Robinson. I'm the editor-in-chief of Current Affairs magazine, and I am joined today by Professor Mark Paul. He is a uh, an assistant professor at the School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers University. He joins us today because he is the author of the new book, The Ends of Freedom, Reclaiming America's Lost Promise of Economic Rights, available from the University of Chicago Press. Mark Paul, thank you so much for joining us at Current Affairs today. Oh, thrilled to be here. You open your book with a, an extended quote from the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, who took a trip to the United States in 2017 and produced a report. And his uh, conclusion in that report was a little depressing, shall we say. It sure was. You know, Philip Austin came to the U.S. about five years ago now, and he's used to touring, you know, uh, refugee camps and war-torn countries and developing nations that are still dealing with, you know, lack of clean water and sanitation and things along these lines. And what he saw in the U.S. unfortunately baffled him. He saw people in the U.S., you know, living in essentially squalor, you know, public squalor amidst, amidst abundance. And, you know, I think what really caught him off guard was when he spent some time in Skid Row in Los Angeles, which is actually about a block away from where my office was last year when I was visiting at U.S. I think we had similar eye-opening experiences walking around Los Angeles, the city of dreams and angels, of course, and just seeing people lacking basic access to toilets, right? Lacking food, lacking anywhere to sleep at night. And it really struck him and I think should strike each and every one of us that we are living in this extremely wealthy country, yet we have 40 million of our fellow Americans in absolute poverty. Yeah. You know, I think that does strike a lot of people, but I think, you know, the contrast is very obvious. People walk around, people see it, you really can't miss it. But you as an economist, I feel like one of the things that strikes you in particular when you see this that comes across in the book is that you look at this, but this is avoidable. This isn't necessary. This is a country shooting itself in the foot. This is all completely preventable. That's right. I mean, you know, look, not only is poverty an individual crisis, just public calamity for so many reasons. I mean, as an economist, you know, I have to think about all the, the lost productivity we have from the fact that our fellow humans, our fellow community members certainly aren't working, certainly aren't engaging in very productive activity because they're worried about where they're going to sleep at night. They're worried about where their next meal is going to come. And often we think, you know, that's unfortunate for the individual. But the thing is, is we're part of a society. We're part of a community. We can't think mm-hmm. that way. You know, just because individuals are poor doesn't mean that they're the only ones negatively affected. It makes us all poorer for it. I mean, think about all the people that could have been nurses or teachers or restaurant servers. I mean, in every single profession, instead, these people are just struggling to figure out how they're going to survive the night. And it's it's just a huge drag on the economy. I mean, it's essentially akin to, to dropping anchor and wondering why your ship's moving so slowly when we're talking about poverty here in the U.S. You ask these uh, important questions about our definition of of freedom, right? Your book is called The Ends of Freedom. Freedom is at at the heart of what you're talking about in the the book because, you know, you talk about this distinction between negative and positive rights. So it's not just, you know, look, we could be growing the economy here. Well, if we take freedom seriously and we actually want to guarantee it to people, you ask those important questions. What is the value of a constitutional prohibition on laws of bridging free speech to the resident of Skid Rose without access to a toilet? What good is the right to vote to the person who's too sick or too lacking time off work to get to the polls? And it also, it not only means that we have so much potential that we are not realizing, but it makes hollow what is supposedly the central ideal of the nation. Yeah, you know, I mean, American freedom, at least in its hegemonic form, needs a serious rethink. Neoliberalism has promised us that as long as we have, you know, what we traditionally call negative freedom, so freedom of limited government, freedom from coercion, as long as we have that plus access to 
you know, these mythical free markets, we are going to be doing just fine. But the reality has played out to be quite different from that. You know, when we think about Jefferson's promise, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, I think we can quickly realize that tens of millions of Americans continue to be denied those basic freedoms here today. You know, civil rights are one aspect, as are political rights, but neither of those are enough, nor are reproductive rights, which are increasingly coming under attack across the United States. Reproductive rights are also coming under increasing attack with the strike down of Roe versus Wade by the Supreme Court and the enactment of increasing restriction to reproductive care uh, across the states, particularly in the South where you're located. And so we need to stop being on defense and thinking about limiting the rollback of freedom and instead go on offense and actually rethink what does freedom mean? What is meaningful freedom? And here's actually where I'm going to say I agree with Milton Friedman. I agree that freedom means means actually being free to choose the type of life you lead. It means being free to to realize one's dreams, you know, to a reasonable degree. And today, instead, we see people, you know, dreaming of going to college and they graduate with $100,000 in debt. And rather than an education being a right, it's a debt-riddled privilege. Freedom means taking away the fetters of debt, taking away the, the fetters of shitty bosses and letting people actually live meaningful lives and providing them the, the ability to determine what that meaningful life is for themselves. That's the actual quote we'll use, which is freedom is taking away the fetters of debt, the fetters of shitty bosses. I like that. I like that one. Yeah. No, as you say, it, the, the problem is not with the values that someone like Milton Friedman endorses ostensibly, where he, you know, his famous TV series was Free to Choose, which he made a best selling book out of. Other famous book is Capitalism and Freedom. You know, Free to Choose would be great. That the problem is that under the economic system that he spent his life advocating and sometimes helping to impose on other countries, that kind of freedom to choose becomes a lie. It becomes a, a terrible fraud because when you ask the question, oh, well, are people meaningfully free to choose? The answer is no, their range of realistic options is quite constrained. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And and I mean, what's amazing about this is that neoliberalism fails on its own terms because it never meaningfully engaged with the lack of freedom where we spend most of our waking hours at work. Here, the idea from Elizabeth Anderson, I think is really helpful, this notion of private government. Oh, yeah, she came on the uh, podcast, actually. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, she's fantastic. I think her work on, on the lack of freedom where we spend 45 hours a week, actually in the US, 47 hours a week on average, is something that we all need to contend much more with. Sure, Sure, we need to limit the course of powers of the government, but let's talk about limiting the course of powers of the employer. And that's precisely why people need economic rights. We need to figure out how to detach basic economic security, ensuring we have uh, food on the table and a roof over our head from being subject to the whims of a boss. And what I like so much about your book is that it is a very constructive kind of a work because you don't actually spend that long just identifying the serious dysfunctions in the United States today. You say, well, okay, given these dysfunctions that everybody has talked about and noticed, as we think about how to move ourselves towards some kind of solution, how do we think more clearly about what it is we actually want? Or what you say, you say you offer a comprehensive prescription to address the problem of persistent economic insecurity based on an expanded notion of American and freedom and grounded in an alternative model of, of economic thought. And you say, you know, the United States can, in fact, eradicate poverty, build an economy that works for everyone. And so sketch for us the framework that you think that we need in our heads if we are going to start thinking about what we ought to do in order to fix all this. You know, I think we've all read more than a few books on why capitalism sucks. And so when I set out to write this book, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about why capitalism sucked. But what I really wanted to do is talk about what could replace it. And a lot of this motivation actually came from my time at Occupy Wall Street and you know, more than a decade ago now where people had a slogan, you know, they wanted an economy for the 99 percent, but they didn't exactly know what that meant. And that's OK. That's fine. You know, we can have the broad vision and not know what the policy details look like yet. 
But as a policy economist, I figured, let me sit down and start thinking about this seriously and what the policy details might actually look like. And what I uncovered in doing that, actually, is a lot of the radical history for progressive policy we have right here in the United States that we simply fail to talk about. So in 1944, President Franklin D. Roosevelt actually introduced this idea of an economic bill of rights, which I build on here in this book, which was, in Roosevelt's term, the culmination of the New Deal. It was to provide cradle-to-grave security for each and every person here in the U.S., And some of the cornerstones were things like the right to a well-paying job, which, believe it or not, was part of the Democratic Party platform from 1944 all the way until 88, when Gary Hart ran on his stump speech, the end of the New Deal, when the Democrats finally took this out. But others include things like the right to housing, the right to education. You know, Senator Sanders ran on this idea that health care is a right, not a privilege. And as an economist, I flat out agree with him. You know, there's some things that belong in markets. When I go to the grocery store, the market can help me decide if apples or bananas are in season. But when it comes to life-saving healthcare, the market really has absolutely no role to play. You know, that's something that we should just flat out decommodify, for example. So in the book, I lay out the policy prescriptions to achieve these economic rights while simultaneously trying to uncover the long struggle for these various rights that we've had right here in the U.S. You know, look, We can learn a lot from the social democracies like Finland and Denmark, both of which, by the way, have higher home ownership rates than the U.S. does and higher economic mobility rates than we do here, despite the, the wonderful lies we tell ourselves about the U.S. being one of the most mobile societies in the world. We can learn a lot from these countries, but I also think we can learn a lot from ourselves. I mean, we have such a rich history here. Yeah, this is what uh, Harvey K has come on a couple of times, and this is what he says over and over. He's like, he's like, stop talking about Finland. Start talking about <laughs> Thomas Paine, Franklin Roosevelt. Start talking about, you know, go back and look at the great social democrats and socialists in, in American history. Go back and look at sewer socialists and all the sorts of models that we have to build from here. So the economic rights that you're talking about, you know, you mentioned the right to a well-paying job. You have, you know, you divided into chapters. Part two of your book is economic rights. You have the right to work, by which you do not mean the right to work as in right to work legislation, the right to housing, the right to an education, the right to health care, the right to basic income and banking, the right to a healthy environment. Well, maybe we can start with the, the right to work because people will have heard that phrase right to work before. They're right. We have the right to work. They're right to work laws in uh, you know states across the country. Yeah, we have Alec to thank for that. So what's funny about this is when you and I talk about right to work, we immediately think about the right of an employer to bust a union through open shop, you know, workplaces. And that's what people are going to tell you if you talk to the, you know, DC wonk policy crowd. But when you go talk to your average Americans, and I did this, I, I actually did some fantastic polling with the help of Data for Progress. And we asked people, what does the right to work mean to you? And you know what? The vast majority of people say it means the right to a well-paying job at a decent wage. So you know, most Americans get the right to work and it gets them. The right to work is this idea that anybody willing and able to work should have access to employment and no employment should pay anything below a living wage. It's as simple as that. Now, the policy to get there is a hair bit more complex, but it's really not that big of a deal. In fact, there's really three components that I talk about. But when people tell me enacting something like this is is you know going to be too complicated, I again like to look to history. Everybody has largely heard of the Works Progress Administration, but many people haven't heard of its predecessor, which is the CWA. And the CWA, which Roosevelt enacted with the help of Harry Hopkins, decided that, you know, people have the right... What does that stand for, CWA? Yeah, the Civil Works Administration decided that at the in the heyday of the Great Depression that they had to put people to work and they had to put people to work fast. Within two months, they put four million Americans, one-tenth of the American workforce, to work doing public works projects, building schools, bridges canals. They even took up a garment factory that went out of business because consumers didn't have any money to buy, you know, to buy underwear, to knit long underwear for everybody. Every single household in Michigan got a free pair. <laughs> now, this is the type of things that they did. Underwear for all. Underwear for all. That's right. You know, long underwear for all. It's cold up there in Michigan. So we've done it before. So what does the right to work look like today? Well, First of all, we need to keep running the economy hot. The Federal Reserve actually has a dual mandate, one of which is maximum employment, something that actually came out of Coretta Scott King's long fight for full employment. The second is that we need to massively expand our 
public employment sector. I mean, here in the U.S., we employ about half as many people accounting for population in the public sector as do Germany and about a third as many as the Scandinavian countries. Now, we could offer so many more helpful government services to lift people up and to improve our everyday lives. We just need to simply expand public employment. And the third is an actual job guarantee. And this has been part of the American conversation for nearly a century now. And it's just the idea that we have, a, as a federal government, should provide everybody a job that wants one, given that the private market will never, ever provide true full employment. I mean, if people want jobs, they're asking to contribute productively to do things to provide goods and services that people want and need. You know, unemployment is a very strange kind of squandering of human potential. Joan Robinson said of Keynes, he hated unemployment because it was stupid and I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I mean, it's just, hey, somebody wants to contribute to make our society better. Let's tell them they can't is basically what unemployment is. So we got nothing for you. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing left to be done. And it's just absolutely amazing. But why do we have unemployment? because capitalism necessitates it. We have unemployment because as the Polish economist likes to talk about, the bosses would rather have discipline in the factory than economy running full steam ahead. And the reason we have unemployment is because we need the threat of unemployment to always exist or else that hierarchical top-down workplace that we all know and hate wouldn't be able to function in order to benefit the bosses. Yeah, it would be a radically different uh, world if, no one really needed their particular job and could at any point go, well, you know what? I don't actually need this job. I could go get a different job. That's right. And this is what we're starting to see right now with what's starting to become a slightly tight labor market by historic standards. You know, is three and a half percent unemployment, full employment? No. But we're seeing workers switching jobs at higher rates than they used to. And it's resulting in huge wage gains for the lowest income workers. And it's also resulting just in better work conditions. You know, people moving away from just in time scheduling that just absolutely screws workers, especially those with families. And we're seeing folks just move into better jobs, higher paying jobs, more rewarding jobs when they have the choice to. People don't work in shitty jobs because they love flipping burgers at McDonald's. People work in shitty jobs because it's the only option they have available to them. Yeah, so if you expand the range of options so that people don't have to take the shitty jobs. How do you feel about this term labor shortage? I always get so annoyed at the way the term labor shortage is, is used because there are all these attempts to loosen the child labor laws now with employers going, well, there's a labor shortage. And I always think, well, have you tried like doubling the pay on offer and seeing if there's still a labor shortage? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, just as Mark said, we always need a reserve army of unemployed and the employers crying wolf over labor shortages is just them trying to figure out how do we keep wages down and employees on their heels. The last thing they want is for employees to feel empowered. Now, that's when the authority of the bosses starts to get challenged. That's when wages start to go up. That's when they start to see their profit share starting to fall. And that's not what they want to see. Labor shortage is just class warfare, you know, put into language that you can print on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. It's very annoying to me because I see people who should know better kind of repeating it when it to me, it seems like, well, what are you really saying? You're saying I can't find enough workers to accept the deal that I am currently offering. <laughs> It's really interesting to think about this in a dynamic sense too. Let's say they're right for a second. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say we have a labor shortage, which is just not the case, right? We have lots and lots of people that are currently unemployed that want jobs. And we also have lots of people that are out of the labor market that would like to come into the labor market if they saw decent jobs available. But let's just give them the benefit of the doubt for a second. If there were a real sh labor shortage in society, you might've been able to argue there was during World War II when unemployment was about 1.7%. Okay, half of what it is today. So clearly we have lots of room to run. Let's just say though there was, guess what? We would start automating a couple really low productivity jobs. Rather than having people flip burgers at McDonald's, we would get rid of the shitty jobs that people don't want and transition those people into better jobs. That's what happens. You have actual labor shortages. We have higher productivity growth. We have workers transitioning to better jobs. That is a good thing. We shouldn't want this as society. This is how we evolve. Now, that's not where we are, but nevertheless, we can't think about the labor market as a something frozen in time. People are constantly shifting from low productivity to high pay productivity jobs. And, and that is an advance for society. Yeah. One of the 
absurdities slash tragedies of the economy as we have it is that people have to fear automation, which is odd because automation should be exciting. It should be like, well, now now no human has to do this thing. They can they're free. We're freeing them. But instead, we know that people will suffer if they lose their jobs because we don't have fallbacks. Yeah. So I wrote a report for the Roosevelt Institute a couple of years ago that we called Don't Fear the Robot, Fear the Policymakers. Robots, they make us collectively richer. I mean, today, this comes back to core argument in the book, which is today that we have plenty to go around. Scarcity is something that we impose on individuals. There is no scarcity as a society at this point in our development, right? We have plenty of food, plenty of housing, plenty of healthcare to go around. It's true we might have, you know, we might need to train more doctors and nurses or teachers, sure, but we have enough people to be able to do all those things. That scarcity is purely self-enforced through the policy process. But the robots just keep making our lives easier. What we need to fear is when we use the robots as a way to keep the poor on skid row by telling them, sorry, we don't have any jobs for you, rather than doing what the unions have been fighting for, for again, near a century now, which is, oh, why don't we engage in work sharing? We can reduce work hours. You know, Keynes told us in this beautiful essay, Economic Possibilities of My Grandchildren, that we'd all be working 15 hours a week right now. Uh, Well, yeah, I know. It sounds nice, huh? Even some of the wealthier countries that are engaging in reducing work hours, they're dreaming of 35 hours. So we're still pretty damn far for 15. But if we actually shared those gains equitably, we really could be working 15, 20 hours a week and picking up whatever our hobbies are. People could be reading more current affairs issues while kicking up their feet at the promenade. Yeah, that's what we need. More time for magazines. I'm totally in favor of any policy that uh, encourages <laughs> magazine leisure time. Now, I, I do want to talk about at least one of these other rights that you have in part two of the book. Perhaps the right to an education is an interesting one because it strikes me that this is another area of just massively squandered human potential where it's like every obstacle to people learning stuff <laughs> it seems like an example of society kind of shooting itself in the foot. Yeah. So right now, you know, the U.S. used to lead the world and college educational attainment. And today we've dropped all the way down to 14th. And I think we can take a step back and ask, why is that? What's going wrong? Are kids not wanting to go to college anymore? No, that's not it. You know, is it that we're not funding our public colleges and that college has become this just debt riddled system full of booby traps and, you know, other nasty things along the way, pushing people out at every single turn? Yeah, that actually is it. When you look at the data, you look at why do people not go to college or why do people leave college? It's because they can't afford to stay. They have to make money to put food on the table. They can't take out enough debt to actually make ends meet when they're in college, things like this. And we're all collectively poor again for it. I mean, by not training the American workforce, we're losing out on a tremendous amount of economic growth. But look, people on the left often make these arguments that I'm making and say, you know, the economy would be bigger if only we invested in higher ed, if only we invested in pre-K. And and those things are true. But we're not playing the game of monopoly here. We're not just trying to right. you know, b- make as much GDP growth for the hell of it. We're also trying to live in a decent society where we recognize that education is a fundamental essential to be, be part of our struggling democracy at this time. I mean, if we want to fight against fascism, education is a damn good place to start. So by not investing in education, we're not only you know slowing the economy, but I think we're really further threatening the stability of our democracy. Constantly people saying, well, look, Americans don't know anything. They can't they can't identify the three branches of government. I think I just saw I think in that paper yesterday that was like, uh, you know, only 14 percent are proficient in civics or, or something. And it's like, well, yeah, maybe if you took seriously the idea that everyone had, as you put it, <laughs> the right to an education, if you guaranteed that right and you took it seriously and you made sure that a quality of education was provided to every person then you'd start to see that people would know things because that's what an education is. We have to invest in one another as a community. I think that's exactly what we need to be doing. I think one interesting thing to note here is that, you know, we didn't used to have access to free high school the way we all do today. I mean, I'm a product of public school systems, K through PhD. I went to public schools, but 
over a hundred years ago, I might've been able to go through grammar school and the grassroots movements fought for and won access to free high school. And they deemed it necessary to be able to be a member of society in the early 20th century. And here we are today in the you know beginning still stages of the 21st century, and times have changed yet again. Our jobs require people to have a college degree. I mean, it's estimated that by 2030, 71% of jobs will require a college degree. Yet here we are with roughly 30% of Americans holding college degrees. How do we close that gap? We provide people with free college. Now, you mentioned there that you uh, went to public school through your PhD, and uh, looking uh, up your, uh, you studied economics at the UMass Amherst. I don't know if people know, but as I understand, one of the few econ departments in the country that has sort of the radical heterodoxy, where people often on the left, we say that the problem is with economics, or we criticize, you know, economics, this is the problem with economics. And it's true that many of the criticisms of economics are valid in terms of mainstream economics. But there are economists, uh, you among them, and I assume some of the uh, professors that you studied under among them, who are trying to rework the economics profession to purge it of some of these ideological presuppositions that lead economists to be associated with disastrous neoliberal policies. Yeah, I was lucky enough to get to go to UMass Amherst for both my undergrad and PhD. I actually uh, took a brief detour out of high school and went to culinary school and worked for a few years. And then 2008 financial crisis happened. And I was lucky enough to be from Massachusetts and have this kind of radical alternative economics department in my backyard. A lot of this was just luck, right time, right place. And I uh, thought I'd go back and get a bachelor's degree. And next thing I knew, I was hooked and I just couldn't look away from economics. And really, it's because of my time in the kitchen, as a matter of fact, where I was working alongside fellow cooks on the line, and none of us could afford to go to dinner at the restaurant that we had all been cooking in. I mean, no way could I have imagined paying $150 for a meal back in 2006. I was making $7, $8 an hour back then, unfortunately, today, what still people are making in a lot of those jobs. And so that got me asking questions about the economy. And at UMass, my professors, rather than asking, how do we maximize GDP, we're thinking about how do we improve the human condition? How do we make sure that each and every person has enough? How do we build an economy that works for the people rather than the corporations? And I got a just a fantastic education there that helped me read the classic great thinkers, the Keynes, the Marx, actually reading Smith rather than stealing one line on the invisible hand and saying, this is all Smith ever said. Smith was a brilliant and nuanced thinker that the, the right has very effectively simply weaponized to tell their simple, magical, false story. So if you know people want to read economics, there's a lot to learn there. It's just the st stuff we teach in modern day graduate schools is just utter, it's utter bullshit. But you know, I have to say, we're losing the fight within the profession, but I think we're starting to win the fight in the public domain. People get that neoclassical economics is garbage. Policymakers are starting to get it, at least on half the aisle. And the other half, I think, get it too. They just realize that it's in their class interest to, to pretend in public. So I do think that the economics in the public debate is changing in radical ways. I mean, Biden presidency is an example of that. I think a lot of what President Biden has done was just completely unimaginable under Obama. And why? It's because of the economics, actually. It's just funny, every time I read it, like a good a good thing on economics, like the person is somehow associated with UMass Amherst. <laughs> I'm like, what if we had 20 departments out of the hundreds in the country? So one of the things I like about people who from UMass Amherst economic department is that you take the, the uplifting rhetoric about, you know, what we all deserve a right to, and you start to think through the math, which is okay, well, all right, how do we actually, there's this great uh, paper on how to fund Medicare for All by Gerald Friedman of UMass Amherst. So, you know, okay, well, people say, how are you going to pay for it? Well, here's how we're going to pay for it. And this is what you do in the last part of your book, which is the end of chapter 10 is how do we pay for it? You've gone through and, you know, we haven't had time to go through every one of the rights that you talk about here or the policies you lay out or all the history that you go through. But once you've laid out, these are the things that we have a moral entitlement to. These are how they make the country better. You realize that the the next question that anyone asks you is going to be, well, do show me the math. <laughs> so yeah, 
It's the trillion dollar question, right? And we can't avoid it. I just grab the bull by its horns and say, yeah, let's talk about this trillion dollar question. How do we finance an economic bill of rights? It's a reasonable question. We can separate it into to two parts. We have to ask, where do the dollars and cents come from? And then where do the real resources come from? Because it's true that every dollar of spending needs to be offset in some way. But it's also true that we have to be really concerned with how do we ensure we have enough affordable housing, which just simply does not exist today to ensure that every single person is home is you know housed. It means we're going to have to build a lot of houses. That's where the real resources kick in. So is an economic bill of rights going to be expensive? You know, you bet. But this is where the federal budget comes in. I mean, right now we have a federal budget that subsidizes violence and imperialism. And we need to transition that to a federal budget that prioritizes care and human well-being. And that is eminently reasonable. And I actually look at a lot of the numbers in the book where we think about, you know, okay, if we want Medicare for all type program, will taxes go up on a lot of middle income people? And I'm honest, yes, yes, they will. But that's not the right question we need to be asking ourselves. What we care about isn't just if my taxes go up, it's at the end of the day, will I have more money in my pocket or less? And will I have more stable health insurance or less? If under a Medicare for All program, which is cheaper than our current program, I should mention, we are going to have a system where you're guaranteed health care your entire life while the average American has substantially more money in their pocket at the end of the day. Because we should think about all of the co-pays, all of the deductibles, all the health insurance premiums. Those are all essentially taxes. So we're just going to say all of that's going to get taken out of your paycheck instead And in fact, we don't even need to take as much out as you currently pay. And so people will be made better off. And that's what really matters. As an economist, we call this discretionary income. After you pay for your basics, are you going to have more money to spend on leisure and have health care? And the answer is yes. And that's a pretty damn good trade-off. Yeah, it's something we really got to do a lot of work to destroy this kind of framing in politics that is very, very annoying. And it applies to the way that The deficit is talked about. You talk about deficit spending a lot in the final part of the book and just spending generally, which is that, you know, and and you saw this even in the Democratic primary debates in 2020, wherever I was going, or a bunch of candidates were going, wow, look how much Medicare for all would cost. Or Republicans go, well, look at the size of the deficit. You're like, look, you can't just point to a big number and act as if the money is being thrown in a hole and set on fire, Right. The money is being used to get things, and the things are things that are supposed to make you better off. And by pointing to one side of the balance sheet, which is the spending, and not looking at and drawing people's attention away from the massive benefits that you get from the spending, you're not rationally assessing the question of whether spending this money is a good way to get the desired result because you're excluding discussion of the result. You're just talking about the money. Yeah, but you're thinking about things here rationally, Nathan, and that's precisely what we're trying to avoid. But I mean, in all seriousness, you know, a lot of these rights that I outline in the book would involve substantial public outlays of funds, but they'd also involve a tremendous amount of savings. This is something we don't talk nearly enough about, which is how expensive our current messed up system is. I mean, how expensive the current higher education system is for everyday Americans, how expensive the current health insurance system is for everyday Americans. I mean, look, I have a good job and I pay $830 a month in help for health insurance premiums. It's a lot of money. If my taxes go up $500 a year, but I don't have to pay that $830 in in healthcare premiums anymore, I am better off at the end of the day. And it's also because I know I won't have to switch health insurance again. I calculated the number. Since I've been an adult, I've been on 14 different health insurance plans. It is terrible, terrible system. You know, will everybody have to switch if we move them over to a Medicare for all program? Sure. It's going to be a one-time thing. So speaking of funding, I want to bring up one other piece that I'd like us to be discussing more in our political debates, which is this idea of a maximum income and maximum level of wealth. We talk a lot about minimum wages, but what we don't talk enough about is maximum wages. Roosevelt actually first proposed a maximum income, which is the equivalent of about $425,000 today. And not only did he propose this in order to raise money for important social programs, 
And here I fully agree with Roosevelt. He thought this was essential to protect our democracy and ensure we didn't crumble into oligarchy, which is precisely where we find ourselves today, where a government ruled by and for the rich. And how do you prevent that? You use a fancy thing that economists like to talk about called the Pigovian tax, tax on social harms like cigarettes and alcohol. And you acknowledge the rich are a social harm. And it's time we start taxing them accordingly. Well, I've got to follow up, though, by asking you, and it applies to a number of the proposals that you outline in the book, the classic libertarian response to anything like that and to social welfare programs. But what about incentives? When you take away the possible reward for productivity, you're going to you're not going to get your wonderful innovation and entrepreneurship. And when you guarantee everyone a floor below which they cannot fall, they will become indolent and unproductive. Respond, please, Mark Paul. Do you know where most of our drugs end up coming from? They come from universities where professors, not at all uh, working in the for-profit model, often get funding from public agencies like the National Institute of Health and engage in research out of the love of research and the desire for respect for themselves and from their colleagues to come up with new and important life-saving innovations. So do incentives matter? Yeah, they really do. I agree. But is the financial incentive of becoming rich only one incentive in the you know huge array of incentives we could be considering? Absolutely. So all I'm saying is that let's move away from using the almighty dollar as the only incentive that we think humans respond to and move towards a system where we come up with a a better system to reward humans for their ingenuity and creativity. I mean, prizes are just one good example. I mean, you know, coveted Nobel Prize, for example, right? Everybody wants one. Folks work really hard their whole life. You know, yeah, it comes with a, a little bit of money. I, you know, it actually comes with a fair bit of money these days. But that's not why people are doing it, right? They're doing it because they actually want to contribute to society. The other thing here is that when we look at these programs and how they've been implemented either in the past in U.S. history or in other contexts abroad, we actually find that the incentive issue doesn't really pop up. So let's talk about the right to work here in the U.S. When we had the Works Progress Administration during the Great Depression, which employed eight and a half million American workers, they had a whole fraud division because there were some in Congress that were worried about this. And they essentially found no cases of fraud or people on the public payroll that weren't working. They didn't find that getting rid of the, the threat of unemployment did away with workers of you know willingness to work hard because people were in it together. They put time and effort into creating a, a healthy workplace culture and that incentivized folks to work. So do incentives matter? Yes. But greed, as Gordon Gecko said, is not good. <laughs> Contrary to what Gordon Gecko said. Well, Sadly, we don't have time, as I said, to go through all of the economic rights of the book, but that's a good thing, because that means people need to pick up a copy of The Ends of Freedom, Reclaiming America's Lost Promise of Economic Rights, which, as I have mentioned, is a very helpful and constructive book because it simplifies, it boils things down to, well, okay, it asks the question, what are the basic rights that everyone needs? What are the policies that would satisfy those rights? How do we make this as straightforward and easy to understand as possible? And then how do we think about what it would practically take to implement and to answer that infamous question, how do you pay for it? And Mark Paul thinks about and explains exactly how you would pay for it in The Ends of Freedom, available from the University of Chicago Press. Professor Mark Paul, thank you so much for joining us on Current Affairs today. Uh, It's been a pleasure. The Current Affairs Podcast is a product of Current Affairs Magazine. If you are not subscribed to Current Affairs Magazine, visit currentaffairs.org slash subscribe today and get our glorious print edition. The Current Affairs Podcast is released regularly every week on patreon.com slash current affairs. Thanks for listening.